Think of how and why the landscape changes on the way down. The Tees is one of the longest rivers in northern England. It flows for 120 kilometres from its source in the Pennine Hills to its mouth in the North Sea. We're going to start where the Tees itself begins, high up in the moorlands, around 700 metres above sea level. There's not a single obvious sign of human activity. This high up, farming is impossible because the air is damp and cool, the ground waterlogged. Moorlands cover huge areas of the country. You could walk for a week north or south of here through much the same kind of landscape. On average, there's snow on the ground for three months. This year, it was more like five. It's now the 15th of May, and yet there are still patches of it hanging around. It also rains a lot, about three times more than further down the Tees Valley. And that, coupled with the cool weather, means the ground never really gets a chance to dry out properly. It all adds up to a pretty unpromising place for farming. But as a landscape for feeding rivers, it's ideal. This soggy carpet holds water like a sponge. When the water seeps out of the sponge, the river begins to take shape. At 600 metres above sea level, the Tees is beginning to look like a real river. Moving downstream, it's not long before you come across the first man-made thing in the landscape. What looks like a lake is in fact a reservoir, made by building a dam across the river. The reservoir stores water for towns farther down the Tees Valley. The next man-made feature on the way down is what you might call a boundary line in the landscape. The boundary line is made of local stone. It marks the end of the open moorland and the beginning of the farmland. We're still too high up, however, for crops to grow. The weather is too cool and damp, the land too rough. In Britain, as you come down from the high moorlands, sheep are nearly always the first sign of farmers using the land. Come rain, snow or freezing winds, the sheep spend most of the year out of doors. They're being taken to the highest farm in the Tees Valley, that one at the bottom of the picture, 370 metres above sea level. Downstream from the highest farm, the landscape changes as the air gets warmer. Continuous farmland now fills the valley floor. Continuous, that is, until it's suddenly broken by the best bit of scenery along the whole of the river. A 
waterfall is a break in the smooth downward course of a river, something like a step the river has to cross before continuing on its way. Waterfalls aren't just pretty to look at. There's always a good geographical reason why they're there. The waterfalls along this stretch of the Tees don't just crop up in any old place. They all have one thing in common. They're all to be found where the river crosses a particular kind of rock called windstone. Just along the river, a quarry has been opened up in the windstone layer. Blocks of windstone are unloaded and transferred to a crushing plant where they're pounded into fine chippings. The chippings are used for resurfacing roads. The reason why the windstone is such a good rock for road building is that it's unusually hard. The windstone is much more difficult to break up than this one, another kind of rock that's found in this particular part of the Tees Valley. Now it's this difference in hardness between the windstone and the other rock that's also the key to the waterfalls. To find out how the waterfall was made and what the windstone has to do with it, we need to look at a diagram. We've taken an imaginary slice through the waterfall to give a clear sideways on view of what's going on. The windstone is the darker layer of rock on top. It's so hard that the river can't wear it away. The lighter layer of rock underneath is softer and gets slowly worn away by the water swirling around at the bottom of the waterfall. It's pretty obvious what's going to happen. If we take the water off the diagram for a moment, we can see more clearly. With nothing to hold it up, the windstone breaks off under its own weight. Put the water back on, and slowly but surely the whole process continues. Watch. The end result is that, over a long period of time, the waterfall actually moves upstream from the spot where it started. If we change to a straight-on view, you can see something else that's happening to the landscape while all this is going on. Once again, we'll take the river off the diagram to make it clearer. As we've already said, the position of the waterfall moves upstream as bit by bit the softer rock is worn away and the windstone breaks off. What we're left with is a gash in the landscape with very steep sides with the river flowing at the bottom. The gash is called a gorge. And a gorge is exactly what you'll find below the waterfalls on the Tees. Downstream from the waterfalls, the valley broadens out. To start with, pasture land covers the valley floor. Farther down, as the temperature warms up, the landscape changes to a mixture of pasture and ploughed fields. The riverside towns are getting larger. This is a market town.
that has grown up where a main road bridges the river. Soon, the impression of being in a valley has gone completely. Instead, the river is now in a lowland. Those sweeping curves are called meanders. Inside one of the meanders is the old town of Yarm. Over 200 years ago, seagoing ships used to come up river and unload here. Mind you, it was often a struggle just getting this far. There were so many bends in the river that sailing ships often had to be pulled by horses trudging along the towpath. Even so, Yarm used to be the river's most important port. There was shipbuilding here, sail making too, and farm produce was exported to London and even as far away as the continent. Yarm may have started out as the river's most important port, but it's ended up as a quaint sort of backwater. It has hardly grown outside its meander. The reason why yarm stopped growing is that another place farther downstream nearer the sea was to take its place as the largest port on the Tees, this place, Stockton. Stockton started to grow the moment a new bridge was built across the river in 1771. You can still see it today. Because this bridge is much nearer the sea than Yarm, ships began to load and unload here. A port was built, and on a grander scale, it became the centre of the largest industrial region on the Tees. It's easy to see why industries grew up here. Stockton and nearby Middlesbrough were surrounded by raw materials that were in great demand 200 years ago. There was coal from the north of the river, iron ore from the south, and deposits of salt right on their doorstep. These raw materials gave rise to an iron and steel industry, a chemical industry, and shipbuilding and the waterfront of the River Tees at Stockton and Middlesbrough was the centre of it all. During that period of early industrial development, there was, however, one major problem that needed solving, a problem that had to do with the river itself. There were so many big meanders between the mouth of the river and Stockton that it sometimes took ships several days to do the journey. The 19th century engineers solved this problem by cutting two artificial channels to bypass the meanders. The original natural course of the river has virtually disappeared today. This straight section is one of those artificial channels made to cut off a big curve. So here, for a few hundred metres at least, the river is man-made. Man-made is a good way to describe all the river landscape downstream from Stockton. This is the river estuary, the last few kilometres before the Tees enters the sea. You can still see the heavy industries that started up in the 19th century. And the big towns like Middlesbrough that began to grow at the same time. The man-made landscape has never stopped growing. Right at the end of the estuary, some of the most up-to-date industries in the country have set themselves up on the banks of the river. What is it about the estuary that made them come here? Perhaps the most important thing in its favour is mud. And there are huge areas of it, both sides of the river, for several kilometres upstream from the coast. Now, mud might not look particularly valuable, but this is exactly the kind of land that big modern industry loves to get hold of. 
Once the engineers have dried it out and reclaimed it, you end up with enormous areas of flat land right next to the river and very near the sea. It's the sort of place that's just right for industries like these. The list of modern industries built on reclaimed land by the river is a long one. It includes a nuclear power station and what you can see now a petrochemical works. It includes oil refineries and oil storage depots. Special jetties have been built into the river for ships working in the North Sea oil and gas fields. Just behind the sandy coastline is one of the latest industries to be built on the reclaimed land. It's a new iron and steel works. It's very common to find this industry sited near the sea at the end of a river estuary. This one on the River Tees can show us why. In the first place, big ships can bring the raw material straight in from anywhere in the world. This load of iron ore has come 19,000 kilometers from Western Australia. Other iron ore ships come into the River Tees from South America, Sweden, Canada and West Africa. Direct supply of raw materials from big ships is one advantage of the river estuary. Another is that the iron and steel works can be built right next to the quayside on the newly reclaimed land. Another advantage is space. The stockyards where the steel works raw materials are stored cover a huge area of what was once the mud of the river estuary. This machine is picking up coal, the other important raw material in steel making apart from iron ore. Most of the coal brought in by ship from overseas and fed into the steelworks comes from Australia and Poland. During this programme, we followed the River Tees from its source in the Pennine Hills to its estuary, here next to the North Sea. The changes in the landscape we've seen along the way don't just apply to the Tees. You can find similar ones along most of the big rivers in the British Isles. Perhaps you yourselves would like to look at another river and see how it compares with what you've seen in this film. See what kind of river landscapes you come across. Languedoc has ever known. The price we get for our wine has slumped and we've been badly hit in our pockets. It's because the world market is changing and we've just got to adapt. It's a real problem when people's tastes in wine change so quickly and yet a plant takes years to grow. Wine started to become a popular crop in the 19th century and the port of Set made export easy, but slow. With the coming of the railway, 
the wine boom really took off. Wine became the in drink in all the French cities. The farmers in Languedoc weren't slow off the mark. They dug up their other crops and quickly planted vines. The whole region soon became one big vineyard. Surrounded by vines and a thirsty public, you'd think both the growers and their customers would be happy. Not so. Our tastes have changed over the years. Since vines were first planted, a huge variety of other drinks have taken over. And to be honest, the wine they grew here wasn't particularly good stuff anyway. At this wine exhibition in Montpellier, the local growers are trying to win back customers by offering them quality rather than quantity. But even when people do drink the local wine, they don't enjoy the three or four litres their grandfathers used to get through each day. How much do you drink a day? Mm, not a lot, uh, a litre a week. Do you drink wine every day? No, no I don't. What do you drink? Half water, half wine. A litre of wine lasts me mm, two days. Water. I only drink water. If I invite you home, I'll offer you wine, but I only drink water. Water. Only water? Yes, only water. Another thing that's put people off drinking are the tough drink-drive laws in France. Statistics show that one death in 14 is caused by alcohol, and anti-drink campaigns try to warn people of the dangers. If the police stop you and your test is positive, you can be fined up to 800 pounds and sent to jail for a year. If you've been drinking and involved in an accident, that fine and jail sentence could be doubled. Bonjour, Monsieur, Gendarmerie Nationale, Police de la Route. Veuillez arrêter votre moteur, s'il vous plaît. Monsieur, je vous arrête parce que vous avez commis une infraction au code de la route. Vous venez de franchir un stop sans avoir marqué l'arrêt. Voilà, vous soufflez, s'il vous plaît, vous remplissez ce ballon. No wonder a lot of people think before they drink, before they drive. Voilà, so there's too much wine about that nobody wants to drink. The equivalent of 180,000 Olympic swimming pools, to be precise. What's the solution? The common market, which has a lot to say about the way agriculture is run in all the member countries, has stepped in and is actually paying farmers to destroy their vines. If they grub them up, they'll be paid a subsidy, which will keep them going for a while. Another way for the common market to get rid of those 180,000 swimming pools of wine is to set aside money for burning. The surplus wine is simply turned into industrial alcohol at distilleries like this one. Once farmers have produced their quota of wine, the common market gives them a subsidy if they distill the rest. The problem is that there's now a lake of industrial alcohol as well as a wine lake, and the industrial alcohol is even more difficult to get rid of. In the stony vineyards of Languedoc, the future looks bleak. In the plain, it's another story. The land's fertile, and farmers who have grubbed up their vines can experiment with new crops, thanks to the water from the Canal du Baron Languedoc. They're specially successful with early fruit and vegetables. The combination of a Mediterranean climate and good irrigation is a winner. One of these new farmers, Roger Verne, lives with his family next to the canal. He grubbed up most of his vines five years ago and used the money he got from the common market to set up a good irrigation system. He farms 12 hectares in Mogio, and because of his reliable source of water, he can now grow tomatoes, asparagus, potatoes, and melons. But the price he pays for the water 
has to be deducted from the profit he makes, as does the cost of the plastic sheeting over his melons. It means he's very vulnerable when cheaper produce, from Spain for example, comes onto the market. It's six in the morning and they're already out on the fields picking asparagus. Asparagus is a new crop for Roger, but he can only grow them for nine years. After that, the plants stop producing and have to be grubbed up. The field then isn't able to grow asparagus for another 30 years. Roger is already having to think ahead as to what he'll plant next. Roger employs a few seasonal workers on his farm. They're Spanish, attracted to France by the higher wages and better conditions. His wife, Yannick, works part-time on the lighter farm jobs, like sorting asparagus. But over the past four years, they've had more than their fair share of bad luck. The new crops are especially vulnerable to bad weather. We had a bad hailstorm last July, which destroyed everything. All our apples, tomatoes and melons. And we weren't insured. That was a complete write-off. Two years ago, there was a terrible frost, which destroyed all our cauliflowers. And the same thing happened last year. As well as helping on the farm, Yannick has the house and three children to look after. We don't have the same hours. Roger gets up at 5 and me around 7.30. I look after the children and then the working day goes on until 11 at night. Every day? Yes. Except Sunday. Sundays I get up a bit later. So you have a 15 hour day? Roger, yes. Me too, but a woman's work isn't considered a full time job. Twice a week, Roger drives to market in Montpellier. If he wanted an easier life, he could use the local cooperative. But he actually looks forward to selling directly to his customers. He loves bartering with them. Meanwhile, at home, Yannick gets on with her part-time job, selling kitchens over the phone. Madame Ramadier? Oui, oui bonjour, madame. Madame Vergne de la Société CCM à l'appareil. Without this extra income, they wouldn't be able to make ends meet during the winter. But there's a cloud on the horizon. She's going to be made redundant soon, and another job will be hard to come by. <laughs> 